Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is asynchronous or induction generators. Our objective is to examine asynchronous generators on an introductory level. We'll explore their mechanical and electrical characteristics and discuss their advantages and disadvantages. Additionally, we'll explore a neat application of asynchronous generators beyond the obvious application of powering modern society. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers watch the squirrel cage induction motor, mechanical and electrical characteristics lectures, both available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet, only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. As you are no doubt aware, motors and generators are dual aspects of a single entity that might more holistically be considered a rotating electrical machine. Motors are rotating electrical machines that convert electrical power input into rotational mechanical power output. In contrast, generators are rotating electrical machines that convert rotating mechanical power input into electrical power output. Over the course of the previous lectures, we've primarily explored the motor aspect of rotating electrical machines. Our task today is to correct this oversight and explore generators. Again, generators are rotating electrical machines that convert rotational mechanical power input into electrical power output. Some external mechanical power source known as a prime mover, like falling water, blowing wind, expanding steam, or an internal combustion engine drives the shaft of a generator with given torque and rotational speed and electrical power comes out. Quite like motors, there are three phase AC, single phase AC, and DC generators, each with their own distinguishing characteristics. The type of generators we'll be discussing today, asynchronous or induction generators, are found within the three phase AC branch of the rotating electrical machine family tree. The three-phase AC branch is divided into two sub-branches, induction and synchronous generators. Each of these sub-branches have two additional sub-branches. Induction generators might either be a traditional induction or asynchronous generator, the topic of today's discussion, or a doubly fed induction generator. Synchronous generators, in contrast, might be electrically excited synchronous generators or permanent magnet synchronous generators. We'll examine these other types of generators in greater detail in later lectures, however it's probably worth a moment of our time to compare and contrast these principal types of generators on an extremely introductory level before we dive into the details of one type or another. The induction versus synchronous split tells us something interesting about these two principal styles of three-phase AC generators, notably how the speed of the rotor relates to the stator. The rotors of synchronous generators match or are synchronized with the stator whereas the rotors of induction style generators are not, hence the term asynchronous, i.e. without synchronization. Alternatively, these are known as induction style generators, implying they operate off the principle of induction. Induction, you'll recall, necessitates a changing magnetic field, hence the rotors of induction style generators must be driven faster than the rotating magnetic field in the stator. This is essentially opposite of what we learned about squirrel cage induction motors in the aforementioned lectures. You recall the rotors of squirrel cage induction motors must necessarily lag the synchronous speed produced by the stator, even in the unloaded state. This degree of lag is sometimes expressed as slip, being a percentage of synchronous speed. Asynchronous generators must also exhibit slip to export electrical power, only they must do so in a leading fashion. A generator rotor matching or moving slower than the stator rotating magnetic field isn't a generator, it's a motor. Only when some outside prime mover with sufficient mechanical power grabs the shaft and accelerates it faster than the stator synchronous speed does it become a generator. Again, this is an important point I must reiterate. The synchronous speed serves as an important dividing line. A rotor spinning below the synchronous speed places in an induction machine in motor mode. Conversely, a rotor spinning above the synchronous speed places in an induction machine in generator mode. The outside force of the prime mover, whatever it might be, must exert sufficient effort to push the rotor past the magnetic field in the stator, implying that there's a finite amount of mechanical power that can be extracted from the prime mover and the shaft of a generator doesn't spin freely. This is something the bogus free energy machines you see routinely advertised in the more dubious corners of the internet so conveniently neglect. Any inefficiency in the conversion from mechanical power input to electrical power output would be considered a loss. Losses always occur and you can't get more out than what came in. Besides the rotor and stator speed relationship, another defining feature of the synchronous versus induction split is a particular generator's ability to stand alone. 
As we'll learn in later lectures, synchronous generators are black start capable, meaning from utter darkness, i.e. a grid in a completely depowered state, they can begin generation even if in isolation. A vast majority of large mission critical generators like hydropower dams and coal-fired power plants are synchronous generators. Asynchronous generators, in contrast, necessitate connection to an existing power grid for them to work at all, i.e. it takes power to make power. If the grid is down, an asynchronous generator cannot be used to restart it barring exotic mechanisms. As we'll soon learn, the power an asynchronous generator necessarily draws for operation is direct towards a reactive interchange and goes towards establishing the rotating magnetic field in the stator. This implies asynchronous generators must continually consume reactive power even when exporting real electrical power for use. Synchronous generators, in contrast, can operate at unity power factor given proper control mechanisms. Because of this important distinction, you'll often find synchronous and asynchronous generators working together. Some large, expensive, complicated synchronous generator goes towards establishing the grid, and then numerous smaller, inexpensive, and comparatively simpler asynchronous generators use this established grid connection to come online and help share the load. An example might be a small collection of large synchronous generators at some hydropower dam establishing a grid with a stable voltage magnitude, frequency, and phase shift, and then a couple wind farms with a hundred smaller, cheaper asynchronous generators using this existing grid connection to establish a rotating magnetic field in their respective stators to generate electrical power asynchronously. Lacking the existing grid connection established by the larger, expensive, complicated synchronous generators, the numerous inexpensive smaller asynchronous generators simply won't work. Conversely, lacking the numerous inexpensive smaller asynchronous generators, the larger expensive complicated synchronous generators wouldn't be able to handle the load. Working together, not only do they do the job, they do the job cheaply. This however does not stop hydropower and wind turbine technicians from engaging in open mockery of each other. Ask me how I know. I should note not all hydropower installations are synchronous nor are all wind turbines asynchronous. This is a very simple example at best and not meant to be taken as a fixed truth for any and all scenarios. We'll examine hydropower and industrial wind power in greater detail in later lectures. If we were to go further into the specifics about these four main types of three-phase AC generators, we find all of them possessing stators essentially indistinguishable from one another. Besides their operational differences, really only the design of the rotor physically distinguishes one type of machine from another. The rotor of an asynchronous generator, for all intents and purposes, is constructed exactly like the rotor of a squirrel cage induction motor, being a cast aluminum or copper cage-like structure, often embedded in laminated sheets of iron designed to concentrate the magnetic field. These types of rotors are mechanically simple and necessitate no external electrical connections. This fact makes asynchronous generators reliable and inexpensive. In fact, an off-the-shelf squirrel cage induction motor can be used as a generator if the need arises with little if any modification. We'll examine other types of generators, including their identifying rotors and operating characteristics in greater detail in later lectures. In summary, these characteristics define asynchronous generators. One, the rotor of an asynchronous generator like that of a squirrel cage induction motor, is mechanically simple, inexpensive, and necessitates no electrical connection. Two, the state of an asynchronous generator must be powered by an existing grid connection, i.e. it takes power to make power. The reactive power drawn by an asynchronous generator goes towards establishing the rotating magnetic field on the stator. This implies asynchronous generators always consume reactive power even when exporting real electrical power for use. And finally, three, some external prime mover must drive the rotor of an asynchronous generator faster than the stator, i.e. possess a leading slip for the principle of induction to work. Before we begin our scheduled discussion of asynchronous generation, let's first do a quick review of polarity conventions, electrical power, and mechanical power. Trust me, this brief review sets us up for a hopefully easy discussion of what might ordinarily be considered an extremely complicated topic. Follow me, if you will, on a brief tour of your existing knowledge. You'll no doubt recall way, way back in the basic electrical circuit analysis class, I introduced the concept of polarity for active sources and passive elements. An active source, like a battery, consumes chemical power 
and exports electrical power to a circuit. An active source is characterized as a voltage rise from negative to positive and is identified as forcing conventional current out of it such that the current leaves the positive terminal and returns via the negative terminal. Again, active sources supply electrical power. In contrast, a passive element consumes electrical power. For example, a resistor is a passive element that converts electrical power to heat. A passive element is characterized as a voltage drop from positive to negative and identified as conventional current traveling into it, such that current enters the positive terminal and leaves the negative terminal. Again, passive elements consume electrical power. Once we got through the basics of DC circuit analysis, we expanded our knowledge to include discussions about energy storage elements like capacitors and inductors. While charging, a capacitor stores energy in an electrostatic field and appears to be a passive element which consumes electrical power. While discharging, a capacitor releases that same energy stored in an electrostatic field and appears to be an active source which supplies electrical power. Similarly, while storing energy in an expanding magnetic field, an inductor appears to be a passive element which consumes electrical power. While releasing that same stored energy from a collapsing magnetic field, an inductor appears to be an active source which supplies electrical power. Energy storage elements like capacitors and inductors alternatively store and return energy. Thus, they bridge the definition of active sources and passive elements. For this reason, capacitors and inductors are sometimes called reactive elements. After some introductory lessons on sinusoidal properties, we again expanded our knowledge to include discussions of AC power, of which there are two types, real and reactive. Real power is consumed by a device and goes to work. Reactive power, in contrast, is cyclically exchanged with the source. On a very basic level, time-variant AC power is a product of instantaneous sinusoidal voltage and instantaneous sinusoidal current, where the degree of phase shift between voltage and current determines how much of apparent power is directed towards real power or a reactive interchange. The current through a resistor is always in phase with the voltage across it. Passive elements like resistors always consume positive real power and no power is directed towards a reactive interchange. In contrast, current through purely reactive elements like capacitors and inductors either leads or lags voltage across it by a full 90 degrees. Pure reactive elements direct all power towards a reactive interchange. Periods of positive power coincide with the reactive element acting like a passive element consuming power, whereas periods of negative power coincide with the reactive element acting like an active source supplying power. In a perfect world, the periods of positive power consumption are equal in magnitude and duration to the periods of negative power supply. Reactive elements essentially bounce power back and forth, and in the end, no real work gets done. Aside from pure capacitors and pure inductors, most real-world components are a mix of resistive and reactive natures. Consider these plots of voltage across, current through, and power consumed by a motor winding in a lightly loaded condition. Motor windings can be considered a mixture of resistive and inductive elements. The resistive portion accounts for usable power and losses whereas the inductive portion accounts towards establishing the rotating magnetic field central to a motor's operation. You will note that periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding behaves like a passive element and consumes power, some of which is directed towards losses, some towards usable mechanical power output. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding behaves like an active source returning or supplying power to the source. In the end, there's an average consumption of positive real power as evidenced by the center line of the time variant power waveform. This average value is the real power portion of apparent power. Conversely, the periodic pulses of excess positive and excess negative power exchanged between the motor and the supply are those reactive interchanges that, while they do not contribute to actual usable output, are central to the operation of the motor and go towards establishing the rotating magnetic field. These diagrams of voltage, current, and power are pretty key to our later discussions on asynchronous generators, so it might be worth a moment of your time to pause the lecture and stare at them until you appreciate them on every level that I do. 
Again, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when an element consumes power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when a device returns or supplies electrical power. As we'll soon learn, asynchronous generators experience more periods of negative electrical power than they do positive, i.e. it exports real electrical power. Lastly, let's review mechanical power. You recall in the Rotating Mechanical Power lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we learned to calculate rotating mechanical power in units of watts as torque T in units of newton meters times rotational speed N in units of RPM divided by the constant 9.55. Additionally, we recall, we arbitrarily established a polarity convention where positive is clockwise and negative is counterclockwise. Consider a speed torque profile of a motor rotating the positive clockwise direction producing positive clockwise torque. Positive times positive yields positive mechanical power output. Similarly, consider this same motor rotating in the negative counterclockwise direction, producing negative counterclockwise torque. Negative times negative yields positive mechanical power output. In summary, motors always produce torque in the direction of rotation and always yield positive mechanical power output. Given this power dust doesn't come from nowhere, a motor consumes positive electrical power input and produces an equal amount of positive mechanical power output minus losses. Generators are different than motors. A generator being turned in the positive clockwise direction resists the prime mover's effort with negative counterclockwise counter torque or braking action. Positive speed times negative torque yields negative mechanical power output. Similarly, a generator being turned by a prime mover in the negative counterclockwise direction resists with positive clockwise counter torque or braking action. Negative speed times positive torque yields negative mechanical power output. In summary, generators always produce torque counter to the direction of rotation and always yield negative mechanical power output. What in the hell is negative mechanical power output? Negative mechanical power output is simply a roundabout way of saying a generator consumes mechanical power input. Given a generator converts mechanical power to electrical power, following this somewhat awkward polarity convention, we can say the generator consumes negative electrical power input. Again, what the hell is negative electrical power input? Negative electrical power input is simply a circuitous way of saying generator produces electrical power output. Trust me, I don't like this polarity shell game as much as you, but I will grudgingly admit it yields consistent, usable results. Again, motors consume electrical power input and produce mechanical power output. Generators, in contrast, consume mechanical power input and produce electrical power output. The polarity convention allows us to remain consistent and will be very useful in the very, very near future. All right, with this newly refreshed understanding of polarity conventions, electrical and mechanical power, let's take a quick look at the mechanical and electrical properties of a score cage induction motor, focusing on five conditions in the far right side of the speed torque curve from the no load through the rated condition to peak or breakdown torque. Yes, I know this lecture is supposed to be about induction generators, but these five quick motor examples sets us up perfectly for a later discussion on generators. Trust me, it'll be worth the wait. Anticipation, as they say, is part of showmanship. Assuming you've watched the aforementioned mechanical and electrical properties of squirrel cage induction motors lectures, we should expect some predictable results as we travel from a no load condition through the rated condition to breakdown. Notably, as torque increases, speed will decrease, slip will increase, and mechanical power will increase. Electrically, we should expect current magnitude to increase, real electrical power input should increase, Reactive power should remain relatively constant. Phase shift should decrease, corresponding to an increased power factor. And lastly, we should observe 0% efficiency at no load conditions, increasing efficiency as we increasingly load the motor, peaking at or around the rated condition, followed by decreasing efficiency as we approach breakdown. Let's see if this is the case. During this exercise, we'll make use of a 200 watt Y configured three phase AC squirrel cage induction motor with a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM intended to operate using a light industrial 120 volt line to neutral 
208 volt line to line 60 hertz three phase AC. Consider this plot of voltage in red, current in blue, and power in purple for one winding of this motor in the unloaded condition. The plots of the other two Y configure windings are essentially duplicates of the same one, only phase shifted by a relative 120 degrees. In the unloaded condition, the motor spins relatively quickly at 1770 RPM, but produces no usable torque. You know, even in the unloaded condition, the no load speed is slightly less than the synchronous speed of the stator with a slip of roughly 1.7%. An application of the mechanical power equation demonstrates this motor is producing zero watts of mechanical power output. Well, that's what you'd expect. It's the unloaded condition. This being said, it's still drawing current. On the order of 720 milliampers, with a pretty large phase shift of 65 degrees, synonymous with a super low power factor, all the while experiencing the line to neutral differential of 120 volts. As in our previous review, some pretty understandable electrical interactions are occurring here. Periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. In the end, there's an average consumption of positive real power as evidenced by the center line of the time variant power waveform on the order of maybe 34-ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming around three times 34, or maybe around 100 watts of real electrical power in the unloaded condition. Keep in mind, it's not doing anything. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding supplies electrical power. These periodic pulses of excess positive and negative reactive power don't contribute to actual usable output. However, they're supremely necessary in establishing the rotating magnetic field. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 80-ish vars. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 80, or roughly 240 vars of reactive power. In summary, in the unloaded condition, the motor produces zero watts of mechanical power output and consumes 100 watts of electrical power input. This amounts to an efficiency of 0%. Again, it's the unloaded condition, and this shouldn't be a surprise. A majority of apparent power, on the order of 240 vars, is directed towards a reactive interchange essential to the establishing a rotating magnetic field. Now consider these same plots of voltage, current, and power when I lightly load the motor so it produces 0.5 newton meters of torque. Speed drops to 1759 RPM, and slip increases to 2.3%. In application of the mechanical power equation, demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 92 watts of mechanical power output. Current magnitude increases to 758 milliampers with a decreasing phase shift of 62 degrees corresponding to increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Looks like the center line of the time variant waveform increased to 43-ish watts for the single winding. Given this one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 43 roughly 128 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous unloaded condition, real electrical power consumption increases. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. This reactive interchange doesn't contribute to actual usable output, however it's necessary in establishing the rotating magnetic field. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 80, 81-ish vars. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 81, or roughly 242 vars of reactive power. Compared to the unloaded condition, reactive power kind of stays the same. Given the motor is producing usable output, efficiency rises to roughly 72%. In summary, in comparison to the unloaded condition, in the lightly loaded condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power was relatively unaffected, and efficiency increased. Let's again increase oppositional torque, this time to one newton meter. Speed drops to 1708 RPM, and slip increases to 5.1%. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 179 watts of mechanical power output extremely close to the 200 watt rate of condition. We might be at or about the region of peak efficiency. Current magnitude increases to 983 milliampers with a decreasing phase shift of roughly 48 degrees, corresponding to an increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. 
looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform increased to 80 ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming roughly three times 80, or roughly 240 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous conditions, real electrical power consumption increased. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 87-ish VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 87, or roughly 262 VARs of reactive power. Compared to the previous condition, reactive power did go up, but only marginally so. Efficiency rises to roughly 74.4%. Given this is close to the rated condition, this might be at or around peak efficiency. Things can only get worse from here. In summary, in an increasingly loaded condition, super close to the rated condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power was relatively unaffected, and efficiency increased. Given we're near the rated condition, we might be at or around peak efficiency. Let's again increase oppositional torque, this time to 1.5 newton meters. Speed drops to 1645 RPM and slip increases to 8.6%. Let's again increase oppositional torque, this time to 1.5 newton meters. Speed drops to 1645 RPM and slip increases to 8.6%. An application of the mechanical power equation demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 258 watts of mechanical power output little past the 200 watt rate of condition. We might be beyond the region of peak efficiency. Current magnitude increases to 1.3 amps with a decreasing phase shift of roughly 39 degrees corresponding to an increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform increased to 122-ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming 3 times 122, or roughly 366 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous condition, real electrical power consumption increased. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. For the single winding, this amounts to roughly 97-ish VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming 3 times 97, or roughly 291 VARs of reactive power. Compared to the previous condition, reactive power did go up, but only marginally so. Efficiency drops to roughly 70.8%. As we anticipated, we're past the rate of condition, i.e. the region of peak efficiency, and efficiency has characteristically dropped. In summary, in an increasingly loaded condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power did go up, but only slightly, and efficiency went down. Alright, last look at motor mode. Let's make this quick. Oppositional torque has increased to 2 newton meters, just shy of breakdown. Speed drops to 1561 RPM and slip increases to 13.3%. Things are super bad. The motor is making sounds like a walrus struggling up two flights of stairs on a hot summer day. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 327 watts of mechanical power output, well past the 200 watt rated condition. Unless our goal is to destroy this motor, we probably shouldn't stay here for long. Current magnitude increases to 1.7 amps, off the charts at our present level of vertical sensitivity. Phase shift decreases to roughly 34%, corresponding to an increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform increased to 168 ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming roughly three times 168, or roughly 504 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous condition, real electrical power consumption increased. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 113-ish VARs. Given this one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming 3 times 113, or roughly 338 VARs of reactive power. Reactive power is starting to go up. Efficiency drops to roughly 65%. In summary, 
in the breakdown condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power starts to go up, and efficiency continues to decline. All right, let's review what just happened. We placed a motor in various torque and speed conditions, concentrating the far right-hand side of the speed torque curve and observed mechanical and electrical properties as we did so. As we transitioned from the no load condition through the rated condition to peak or breakdown torque, we observed the following. Speed decreased. Slip increased. Mechanical power output increased. Current magnitude increased. Phase shift decreased. Power factor increased. Real power input increased. Reactive power did increase, but not dramatically so. And finally, efficiency went from 0% in the no load condition, peaked at or around the rated condition, and then decreased. In summary, everything you would expect from a squirrel cage induction motor. Importantly, we observed plots of time variant power for each of these conditions. Periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage, negative current, or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. Now let's do the same thing for generator mode. That's what you came here for, right? We should observe intriguing reactions, some similar to motor mode and some startlingly different. 